Hey, Talking Cars fans. We really love making Talking Cars each week, but we want to make sure you enjoy it as much as we do. That's why we've created a survey to find out what you like best about the show, what you want more of, and what we can improve on. Go to cr.org slash Talking Cars survey and let us know how we can make the podcast better. We really want to be your favorite automotive podcast, and your responses can help make that happen. Thank you for your help, and enjoy the show. It's that time of year when we bring together our latest information for the 2020 Auto Spotlight, including some very specific questions about electric vehicles. We also talk about our final test results of the 2020 Ford Escape Hybrid and take audience questions next on Talking Car. Hi, and welcome to Talking Cars. I'm Jennifer Stockberger. I'm John Lincove. And I'm Jake Fisher. So I'm going to jump right in because this time of year marks the time when we bring together all of our latest test data, reliability data, into what we've come to know as our auto spotlight. It is our April auto issue, which is all cars, the corresponding content on consumerreports.org, and things like top picks and brand report card, which perennially people have come to appreciate. John, before we get going, just talk a little bit about what goes into the recommended cars, the overall scores, et cetera. Sure. sure. Um, a few years ago, we introduced the concept of an overall score, and basically, we take a vehicle's road test score. So that's right. how it performs in our 50 odd tests that we mm-hmm. perform up here at the Auto Test Center. Um, so that gets a score from mm-hmm. that based on our jury. Then you look at how well, if a car performs well enough in crash tests by National Highway Traffic Safety Administration right. and the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, if tested. Right. They may not be right. tested, they're brand new. Um, but you can't have a, a, a poor performance there. Um, then we look at our reliability and our owner satisfaction data, results from our, um, our auto surveys. Right. Um, we compile that. And all of that is, is put into a big bowl and then mixed together, and we come out with an overall score. And the overall score really is the determination of uh, if a vehicle can be recommended or not. You know, obviously, High you can't enough. have a super low right. reliability score. That would impact the overall score. So it all works together. And there's uh, certain thresholds, and vehicles over that, depending on the type of category, right. um, it's able to be recommended, which leads into how we choose other parts and more narrow focus uh, at work, you know, at the, of our uh, product. Right. So very specifically, and changing over time, Jake, is included in that overall score and requirements for top picks is some specific safety bonuses. Yeah, well, so so one so safety isn't just to, today safety is not just about crash right. tests. And safety is also about how to avoid those crashes. And certainly we do like, you know, brake tests and emergency handling all that stuff that we do in our tests. Yep. But more and more vehicles now have this uh, automatic emergency braking, blind spot warning, um, forward collision warning, these types of systems that can help you avoid right. collisions. All the and, if the, and if it's <laughs> standard, we're giving points in our ratings, and that actually helps them do better, which potentially could help them be a top pick or be recommended. Um, this year, um, in order to be a top pick or even considered a top pick, you right. need standard pedestrian detection in addition to automatic emergency braking, forward collision warning, which we have had a requirement in the past. So, um, you know, when we've chosen this, I mean, there was some vehicles that yeah. would have been a top pick, but without that standard pedestrian detection, automatic emergency braking, which we're seeing a lot of uh, fatalities because of these types of incidents, um, you know, no longer are you qualified. Right. So it just one kind of upping the bar, if you yeah. will, for that top pick designation. Um, there's also a little bit, a couple of changes in how we've presented the data, too, for this year. Sure, sure. Well, you know what? what's really interesting, if you look at the, the whole lot of vehicles, mm-hmm. and, you know, there's traditional, a lot of people talk about luxury cars, right? right? And we kind of sit there sometimes scratching our heads, like, what is a luxury car beyond, like, a brand name mm-hmm. because some <laughs> that mean well yeah. you look at some of the cars you look at you know mercedes-benz who's like marching down market to like have these small front wheel drive cars you got cars like hyundai that's marching up market with like really nice yeah. quiet comfortable yep. look you know well-appointed vehicles. feature laden yeah. we decided you know when we start looking at these and we look at top picks and finding the best cars maybe that time has come and gone. Mm-hmm. Then we're not gonna say, hey, this car is good because it's a good car for having a luxury brand. Yeah. You know what? If you want a luxury brand, you could go get a luxury brand, that's fine. 
the issue is, is that what is a car in a certain price range that performs the best? And you could go and you could say, okay, here's what I got to spend. I'm looking for an SUV. Um, well, you know, take a look at um, cars that have comfortable seats, look at cars that yeah. have a nice ride, right. have cars that have, you know, nice finish. And sometimes the best choices aren't the ones with a traditional <laughs> luxury brand name. Well, and we've said on the show tons of time, people say, oh, I'm looking for a compact SUV and I want something that has a nice interior and it drives well and it's reliable. Right. Well, for 40 grand, you could buy a Mazda CX-5 with a, a high level trim, you know, le leather yep. everywhere, great vehicle. Or you could buy one of those entry level Germans, you know, the, the CLA, the GLA from Mercedes, the Audi Q3, but you're not necessarily getting that luxury experience. Right. And the driving and the quiet. Now, you can't get all of that a6, A8, Q7 performance right. in a $40,000 And you brand. don't need right. us to tell you that right. an Audi brand, what it leads to you versus a Mazda. You don't need us to do any testing for that. Right. You need us to figure out, okay, which is how, comparatively, what's going to be more nice inside. Mm -hmm. In or, a price well, these, range. These types of things in the yeah. price range, yep. And so, I, so and yeah, I when you look at the that allows people to cross shop in that range of what right. they can sure. afford. You know what, and they may be surprised. Well, the other thing is we're kind of steering away a little bit is, is these traditional sizes, too, right. like right. a subcompact, luxury, yep. small SUV, whatever it is. Because what we find also is sometimes the midsize car has a roomier interior than yeah. a large car. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or a compact or a small SUV has a roomier interior than a, a midsize. So, so really, you may get more car for your dollar. Right. Right. What do In you need the car to do and yeah. how much you can afford? That's right. really the important piece of it. Yeah. So one of the features for this kind of auto spotlight content was a, a kind of an electric vehicle Q&A. We get a lot of questions about electric vehicles. We kind of summarize some of the most popular. Obviously, we've tested a number of these vehicles. So we wanted to touch on kind of three areas of the EV Q&A, if you will. And one of them, John, was range. Yeah, that's uh, probably the biggest question <clears throat> for people considering e, uh, an electric vehicle, just simply because you can't go top off electricity like right. you can gasoline. Mm -hmm. Duh. Um, the things that really affect it, first of all, just exterior temperature. So heating, right. the heat, extreme heat, <laughs> extreme cold affect the battery range. But then also what you do to counter that in the sense of it's really hot outside, I'm going to run the air conditioner. Right. It's really cold outside, I'm going to run the heat. Those, uh, those factors impact range because you're using the battery to run a heater and to run the air conditioning in the car. Yep. Um, and finally, we took uh, our Tesla Model 3 and our Nissan Leaf and did some some tests, uh, cold sinking, driving it, right. letting it sit, driving them again, and just saw the range really plummet each time. It went down to about, uh, the max range was down by about 50% yep. uh, but, uh, through the testing. So yeah, it, it does have an impact on it. You can mitigate that if you can park inside a garage at night, okay? So you're not getting, again, cold sink into the car, heat sink. Uh, Limit your use of the heater and, and uh, air conditioning. Maybe use heated seats, heated steering wheel, right. uh, ventilated seats. I mean, I know it's a luxury type yeah. feature, but they do, they will well, keep you warm or cool versus the whole cabin, which you may not need. And, and one nice thing about, I mean, like it's 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 crazy cold outside uh, lately. The last couple of weeks, and and you know, auto start mm -hmm. is a thing that you could use if your car's out of your garage, right? Pre you can warm your car. But with electric cars, you can do that in your garage. Yep. So it's be plugged in, oh, you can right. warm up the warm yep. up the car yep. and you don't have to worry about the car running in the garage Certainly. because it's just charging. There's no emissions, right. There's no emissions. Yeah. And I do say personally, even in non EV vehicles, I will often shut off the heat and let just the, the seat warmer mm -hmm. counter that. I don't like all that stuffy air, but I do like the seat warmer, so that's a good. Sure. And to leave, to your point, leave a margin. You know, I know that was advice in the story. Like, you got to give yourself a little buffer. You can't go yeah. down to no range. You have to ex you have Especially to expect it. Using, you have to right, expect that right. there is something. You're going to be running the defroster. You know, yeah. if it's sure. You know, the, you're going to be doing take a moisture out of the air to right. keep the you know the windows unfogged. It it just is going to happen. Right. The other key question that came in that I found of interest was reliability, Jake. Are electric vehicles less reliable than traditional, you know, mm -hmm. gas engines? Well, I mean, we we have a lot of data on reliability, yep. and when we look at cars with big batteries, and you know, the older vehicles are hybrids. I mean, we got lots of data. We've seen data from you know Priuses for right. twenty <laughs> years or so. Um, they're they're extremely reliable. Um, you know, when you really think about it, um, electric cars are much simpler. And I am I've said this before, but yeah. it's like you don't have you know all, all the gears, you don't have the electrical systems that are that are you know with the spark plugs and things exploding and the cooling. I mean, it, it's a much simpler 
vehicle, a lot less things to go wrong. Now, these large lithium ion batteries <laughs> and how they're going to do, you know, 20 years down the road, we don't know that yet because they haven't been around that long. Uh, but the reliability issues that we've seen with electric cars are more tied to the manufacturer than really the powertrain. Right. So if you're buying a car from an unreliable manufacturer or a new manufacturer, you know what, it may be a little bit more iffy than if you get one from a, a one when that's a proven reliability record. It's like, and I would, from the battery side, so far so good. I mean, I, there was a lot of concerns early on that they were going to fail within the life of the car, and we're not seeing that. Well, I mean, what's yeah. interesting is that, you know, I mean, like reliability of, of, of Tesla, for instance, has been kind of up and down, yep. and it hasn't been because of the battery. Right. It's been because of other things. And it's the falcon wing doors. <laughs> it's mechanical things, right? right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Complexity that way. Right. Right. But not of the... The powertrain is pretty good. Yeah. Powertrain. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And then I think the last thing I found of interest was the infrastructure, which people with electric vehicles or thinking about electric vehicles certainly have to talk about. And that is if you're on main thoroughfares, it's pretty darn good. We did a recent study, you know, where we just ran a, a you know, I-91, which is a major commuting area in Connecticut, and it was pretty positive. But I think they only found four charging stations that weren't working and pretty good luck. But and then the data, our data says most people are still charging at home but there is some planning you probably want to go to a 240 volt system just for the length of charging time so anyway ton of information in there not mm -hmm. just on top picks and brand report card and evs yeah. but all the ratings and we encourage you to check that all out so we'll move on to a recent test. It's of the 2020 Ford Escape Hybrid. Mm -hmm. Recall that we have tested the Ford Escape. Um, standard engine was 180 horsepower, 1.5 liter turbo, three cylinder. Three cylinder. Yeah, a little odd mm -hmm. that you hear the three. Eight speed transmission. The hybrid is 198 horsepower, 2.5 liter four cylinder hybrid, all wheel drive, continuously variable CVT transmission. Um, Base price twenty nine seven fifty five. Tested price thirty four seven forty. John, thoughts on the Ford Escape Hybrid? I think the Escape Hybrid, the power, pa Escape's hybrid powertrain, if you will. Um, yeah, easy for me to say. <laughs> Filled in some of the gaps in in what made the uh, first the, the the three cylinder version a little less interesting or, or pleasurable, ple mm -hmm. pleasant to drive. Mm -hmm. um, more immediate power. You don't have any kind of lagging or surging. Um, it, it's just, it, it's not the fanciest gee whiz hybrid displays. It just works well. Right. Um, it, it's relatively easy to drive around on electric power. It's not one where you have to drive with an egg as if there's an egg under the, the <laughs> throttle, the gas pedal. Um, it's, it's a nice small SUV. It's almost that they should just have a hybrid and not a three-cylinder turbo version. Right, right. And, and recall, we had rented the two-liter. What was it? You know, the horsepower was a little higher. It mm -hmm. was a little quicker. And we were like, oh, this is very nice. Then we tested the 1.5 and we were like, ah, there's some low-speed vibration. Maybe not as good. I, I don't understand Ford's fascination with three-cylinder engines. Yes. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I really haven't found one that I like yet. And, you know, it's very interesting that, you know, I mean, I think I've said this before, but it's like, you know, we've gone from, you know, three speed automatics and eight cylinder engines to eight speed automatics yes. and three cylinder <laughs> engines. And it's not a good thing. It's not working. And it's not working. <laughs> and so I think uh, the Escape is a nice vehicle, but that powertrain is a shortcoming for yeah, it. And yeah. this hybrid kind of fixes the problem. It out. And the fuel economy we've got, I mean, it's just really impressive. I mean, it, it wasn't quite what the EPA estimates were, but I mean, this is fuel economy that's better than you get in right. a small car. And mm -hmm. that's amazing for a small SUV, which is highly desirable and great family car. Yeah. And and I will add to standard forward collision warning, automatic emergency braking, pedestrian detection, blind spot warning, rear cross traffic warning, and lane keeping assist. So particularly the blind spot warning, you don't always see that come standard um, packaged up with all the others. So yeah. Ford's been kind of quick with these new generations right. to add that, make that standard, Yep, which is yep. impressive. You right. know, Toyota and Honda, or Toyota and, and Subaru have been putting We're it already on, there, you know, right. already there. But, you know, kudos to, the, to Ford because other domestics aren't. Right, right. So definitely a nice little car, certainly in the hybrid configuration. So moving on to audience questions, love, love them. Keep them coming, talkingcars at iCloud.com. Our first question is from Bill. 
Overall, CR does not seem to like non-standard shifters in cars. In particular, you do not like the push-button shifter in the Acura TLX, which I found to be one of the best features of that car. Could it be that your testing methods are biased against non-standard features? Does having your driver switch between multiple cars make it difficult for each driver to adapt to these systems? When I heard non-standard shifters, I was thinking like, yeah, I don't like standard. I like standard <laughs> shifters, manual yes. transmissions. Yes. Yeah. That's not what he meant. Oh. Well, it's the weird dog legs. That's you know, right. That's what it is. When one's off to the side. Um, well, non-standard shifters, as, the, as, the, as Bill is saying, there's a whole range of them. Right. Some are really well executed. Uh, there are others that are poorly executed. And then finally, ones that are just, you don't know why they went there. For example, General Motors had a J shifter with uh, one of the Cadillacs and, and uh, one of some of their Buicks. And it's gone away quickly. Yep. It just didn't engage well. It didn't work well. Um, whatever their internals were, they, they decided to get rid of that. And now they just use a, a straight monopod where the uh, the shifter will go forward. You, you'll push it forward for a reverse, and then it'll spring backwards to a center uh, position. Um, the, the Honda ones that are in both Hondas and Acuras, there's, yeah. there's all kinds of feedback where people who live with it like it, and then people who get into it don't like it, and they live with it, and they don't like it. Um, it it's... It's, it's awkward to use. Mm -hmm. well, we have. So, 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 so look, I mean, when, when we originally tested these, we're in the, these were the, one of the first mm -hmm. ones that were kind of this un, yeah, unconventional. Right. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, there are some issues with yep. that. But um, Bill is, is right. He raises a really good point um, that, you know, when you live with these and we've done some additional testing and we've actually talk and, talked to a lot of people who own these vehicles and have had them for long, sure. extensive amount of times. And the feedback that we're getting is actually much like Bill. Right. You know, yeah, it was a little hard to figure out at first, right. but you know what? I like it because now I could get to my coffee cup and, you know, it's not in the way. Mm -hmm. And actually, we have modified yeah. our scores right. of these systems, it's particularly the Honda and Acura ones, because also they do have all the safety interlocks. You know, if you open the door, it automatically right. goes to park. Right. You turn off the engine, it automatically goes. So it has some advantages. So, and, um, and you can kind of use. You can kind of use that one without looking. You, you There's can, the reverse of the lever and such. So, so we're looking at a lot of different aspects of this. But um, look, I mean, we always need to evolve our thinking yeah. as new technologies come come around and um, things change and our scores will change. And so, so don't don't worry about it for the TLX. I mean, we are not taking many points off at all mm -hmm. for that particular uh, but shifter. There are ones the the Lincoln buttons across the dashboard. All the, all the little chicklets. The chicklets right. or the yeah. buttons that are horizontal. And, that all and then the also same. Hyundai the uh, has in, in the uh, in their SUV, um, in the Palisade. Yep. Those are difficult to use because they're all very uniform and you have to memorize the positioning and it's a prindled you know, park reverse. So, so you're reaching, you're taking your arm away, you're looking others, away and that's that's a key. Is that right. it's just they're not, not all, the nature, just because right. that they're, they're are... non-standard doesn't mean that they're all executed. Right. Right. We're okay with things that are not standard as long as they're better. Sure. Right. Um, and so we, my we thoughts, always have to remind ourselves. My that. thoughts for Bill was, he's right. You know, we're always getting in and out of something different. We mm -hmm. aren't spending a great deal of time, but on a comparative basis, that's the same thing for all the cars. So it's not like we're living with one and giving it better yeah, scores and not living. It's continuous. And it's not a single right. person doing it and saying, I've lived with right. it now it's and I've for, for five weeks yep. and it's my, and, my feeling. And I also want to make the point that this is not our opinions of these. I mean, this is all based on actual customer feedback, right. mm -hmm. actually doing interviews. We do interviews with people who own these cars and we're trying to represent them, not necessarily, you know, us if we're hot shoes or whatever, right. you know, I mean, not every car needs to be a rear wheel drive diesel station wagon with a stick shift. Yes. You know? right. <laughs> I mean, we're looking, trying to represent the consumers. And, and that's why, you know, I love questions like this. Right. Give us your feedback, you know, tell us what your experiences are and we will go out and seek that too. So sounds like Bill, you are not alone. And, and like Jake says, we'll continue to evolve those ratings. So the second question is from Jason from Wichita, Kansas. I just watched your episode on standardizing the names of safety features. I was wondering what role trademarks and patents play in standardizing these systems. How open are automakers to sharing some of this proprietary data? And just to get to Jason and, and Jake jump in, um, the standardizing of the names shouldn't hurt necessarily either of those things. The patent is going to be around how they do it, 
Is it a camera? Is it a radar? Does it have some special technology? That's what the patent should be around. We are completely technology neutral. What we're saying is standardizing the name of what it does so that people understand what they're getting. And in terms of trademarks, our conversations with manufacturers, we've actually said, call the package whatever you want. Call it Toyota Safety Sense. Call it Copilot 360. Right. Absolutely. We've used the analogy of the recipe and the ingredients. Call it grandma's layer cake, but make sure the ingredients say sugar, flour, you know, mm -hmm. cocoa, forward collision warning, automatic emergency right. braking. I know that simplifies it, but that's kind of way. So yep. grandma's layer cake would be the trademarked piece. That's the a terrible name for a safety package. I know. I just want to say that. <laughs> Marshmallow, well, marshmallow will be front end stopper. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's there a good one. Not. So any thoughts on that to add? Or? No, it, that's exactly right. We shouldn't be preventing any of that, you know, clear patents, clear sure. trademark on yep. the packages. Yep. So finally, last question is from Will. I was recently doing research on buying a used Toyota RAV4 or a Subaru Forester and saw the IHS, Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, passenger front overlap test was rated poor for the RAV4 and marginal for the Forester, even though both are considered top safety picks and are recommended by CR. Should I look for something with a good rating or higher? Am I giving too much emphasis to this category? And would these scores affect your decision when choosing a car for your family? Jake, any mm. thoughts for Will? Well, you know, one thing is that all, all crash tests aren't created equal. Not all of them um, are as common and not all of them are severe to the occupants. And that is actually the newest, right. which is a, a small overlap passenger side. Um, it's kind of simulating a, a not as common occurrence as the driver's side. Also, it's not as common as probably just someone sitting there. Right. Also not as severe as some of the other. So like, you know, if you're looking at something that is a offset crash test for the driver's side, that's important. Absolutely not. Yep. Do not get that. For this, this doesn't mean it's an unsafe vehicle. In fact, if you look at vehicles that were built, say, 10 years ago, whatever whatever Will's driving right now right. <laughs> probably is also poor. Right. Um, he's probably been driving cars like that for a long time. So I wouldn't say this is an unsafe vehicle. Right. Um, but when you look at safety, you know, if you want the best, there are ones that have better and, and, and do that. Right. And and we've said, you know, I just continues to up the ante and in, in adding are, yeah. the mm -hmm. latest, um, obviously the big ones, you know, that moderate overlap frontal, the side impact. Now they had the, then they had the driver's side, small overlap, and now the passenger. They just keep biting off the next thing. Sure. And to your point, doesn't make it unsafe, but it may be a, deal, a tiebreaker, if you will, if you when want you get down the best, to the two that's, that's right. I mean, you know, they put an update on, if they put an update on the, the Tesla Model uh, S that goes, now it doesn't go 0 to 60 in three seconds, now it's 2.5. It doesn't mean the three seconds is slow. Right. <laughs> right. It's just not as fast. Right. And this is the same thing with safety. Right. It doesn't mean it's unsafe, but it's not as safe as the right. latest and greatest. Margin of safety. So before we go, I want to touch on one last question, and it's a common question we get from our audience, and that is, how do they get a job working here, doing yeah. what we do? And it just so happens that Jake has an opportunity. Jake, I'll let you fill yeah, in. Yeah, well, a we, we're actually, you know, I mean, a lot of people asking, how do you how do you do this? Well, you know, fill out a job application. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> it, the truth is that there's, there's we, we don't have a lot of turnover. Right. I mean, I think last time, so we're actually hiring an auto engineer. Um, and I think the last time we did it was probably about 20 years ago because yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's kind of a neat job. But, um, but we are hiring and part of, part of me is somewhat convinced that the right person is already watching talking cars <laughs> to the end potentially yeah. and actually hearing me right now. But yeah, we are hiring and we're looking for someone who is uh, an engineer background um, or some kind of equivalent science degree. Um, also someone who's, you know, going to be representing, you know, normal people right. in driving these cars um you know so we are we are hiring so uh, preferably we're looking for someone with some industry experience yep. perhaps, or at least some kind of testing and cars experience but um you could check the show notes and we right. could you could find out exactly how to apply yeah so that will do it for this episode for everything we've talked about, including all of the information in the auto spotlight, see the show notes, keep the questions coming, talkingcars at iCloud.com, and we'll see you next time.